Thanks to advances in synthetic biology, these days you can make pretty much anything in a fermentation tank, from lactoferrin to carminic acid. But when does it make commercial sense? I generally prefer to think of things in terms of cost and use. Uh, very often you'll find that uh, for a given uh, existing incumbent solution to a problem, uh, the new solution isn't just a drop-in. It's not the same molecule that's made cheaper or more sustainable. It might be a completely different molecule, but maybe it provides the same sensory effect. Uh, I could use our non-caloric sweeteners as a good example of that. They're not you know, a, just a different kind of sugar, right? They're, they're a different molecule altogether, and they're 300 times sweeter than sugar. So the way you formulate them is quite different, but at the end of the day, they have the same sensory benefit. On a mass basis, these you know, non-caloric sweeteners are more expensive than sugar, but on a sweetness basis, the important thing, the cost in use, they're actually much cheaper than sugar. And so they actually have advantages over sugar just based on the economics alone, if you're th talking about cost in use. Most of these things are built on two main chassis, uh, E. coli and the yeast Saccharomyces. Uh, they have the most history uh, of use in synthetic biology and so they're used quite a lot. However, they are not perfect for making every single molecule in the universe. There are many other organisms that are out there that are uh, a little newer to science that are physiologically more advantaged for making large classes of other molecules. And so we explore that quite heavily. We have 14 different host organisms at our company that we employ for this purpose. About half of those are these newer to science organisms that have those kinds of advantages. There's three main styles of fermentation. There's batch, where you just throw in some microbe and some nutrients and do very little else. Then there's fed batch, where you start in the same way as the batch, but you feed in nutrients as the cells grow up and then harvest everything at the end. And then there's continuous, where you are keeping the cells in a constant state of growth and harvesting at the same time that you're feeding them new yeah. nutrients. Um, Depending on what your process is, again, uh, any one of those three might be the most economical process to use. Uh, what's most common in synthetic biology and precision fermentation is to use fed batch, that middle one that I was talking about. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, uh, but uh, yeah, with these continuous processes, which I think are quite interesting, as long as you can maintain the highest levels of sterility, uh, you ought to be able to realize the best economies as well. The biggest challenges in synthetic biology right now, or, or what you already alluded to, is really just around this bottleneck that we have in the manufacturing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but beyond that, uh, there are more minor challenges, I would say, in the regulatory environment. There used to be challenges, which I feel have been largely overcome around public acceptance of things like genetic engineering of microbes to make various things. I think the world is starting to recognize that uh, it's not all just about corn and about pesticides, right? Uh, there are much better applications for these things that have really direct beneficial impacts on humanity that um, I think are very clear and very tangible now. So um, those are the three main things that popped to my mind, but there are other challenges that are included just in terms of you know, uh, people available. Uh, we need more folks that are trained in, you know, process engineering as well as in analytical chemistry and all the other functions that surround the basic core molecular biological skills. You know, what is your experience of the regulatory environment and are some markets, in your view, being held back by the challenging environment? I think as a growing awareness that needs to be accelerated um, around what most domesticated fermentable microbes actually are. I used the word domesticated there very deliberately because there is an analogy to be drawn between domesticated row crops and domesticated microbes. Mm. Uh, domesticated row crops are, have been selectively bred for many, many decades and they have been so derivatized that they really cannot grow in any other environment than the very cultivated plot of a farm. You don't see these ridiculously large sized ears of corn growing wild in the woods. It just doesn't happen because they can't survive in that environment. In the same sense, uh, with the domesticated microbes that we use in precision fermentation, if there's some accidental release in the wild, again, these things have been so heavily derivatized, they just, they're not going to survive. Um, and so that's something that I feel the regulatory bodies have yet to catch up on in terms of uh, the way they, they regulate these things. There's a lot of, um, uh, there are burdens that are placed on us, which we can overcome, and you know we're happy to work with the regulators on this. They're not terribly onerous, but um, you know th there could be maybe with a greater understanding of that aspect around the domestication, there could be a, a smoothed out path in the regulatory side of things. There's a well publicised lack of fermentation capacity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we address this kind of manufacturing choke point in the industry? 
We just need to invest globally, uh, but particularly North America, in more manufacturing. I mean, that's the simplest answer. Uh, it's it's a very capital intensive kind of investment to make, and so uh, there's a certain class of investor that's appropriate for this, and uh, it's not a very large uh, investor pool for those kinds of investments. But you know, there are government incentives that can come into play here that can be very useful as well too. Everything from uh, various kinds of financial incentives, the usual maybe tax breaks or matching fund type donations or, or uh, maybe even just outright you know funding of public use facilities directly uh, you know the model of like the national labs comes to mind where you know these are government-owned labs but they're managed by private in industry the most expensive way to build a new world-scale precision fermentation facility is as a complete greenfield you know you find some native site and you build roads and rail and new piping to it and start from scratch. That's very expensive, you know, somewhere between 150 to 200 million dollars to do it that way. So the way that you can make this more efficient with the capital is by repurposing other sites that already have most of the infrastructure around it. Now, the kind of tanks that you'll find in an ethanol facility, the fermentation tanks are a very different design than a precision fermentation tank. So you can't repurpose the tanks themselves, but you can use the, you know, the concrete slab that it's on, you can use the piping, the electricity, the rail, the road, everything else that feeds into that facility. Generally, it's in the middle of an area that has relatively cheap feedstocks, which is equally important for, for, for precision fermentation. So these are good sites in which to build precision fermentation plants as long as you understand you know, that uh, you're not necessarily repurposing the whole thing, but large parts of it. So you've just announced a capability to produce carminic acid via precision fermentation. So right now, uh, carminic acid, uh, as you alluded to, is made from uh, crushed uh, insects that parasitize cacti, and it's uh, not a very sustainable way to make carminic acid and for that reason it's very supply limited it's a very constrained uh, product and it's also very expensive for that reason as well too it's already however an approved natural food coloring in, in many foods that are out there so uh, when we alleviate this supply crunch we'll be able to bring you know the cost more in line uh, with something that's compatible with larger markets and hopefully make it in a more sustainable way so it Will probably disrupt the natural markets not only for the beetle derived source but also for other kinds of natural colorings as you mentioned beetroot juice there are performance characteristics around uh, beetroot juice which is great by the way mm. but um, it doesn't hold its color through heating and there are other sort of disadvantages that can come along for the ride that carbonic acid can solve so and then thirdly yeah if we can get that cost down, then we can also be competitive with the artificial food colorings as well, too. And many of those are actually going to be probably legislated out of existence because there's mounting evidence that some of them cause cancers. I'm specifically referring to what they're nicknamed the azo dyes. And again, carbonic acid could be a solution for that. Right now, today, uh, the existing carbonic acid market is small. It's about $50 million by revenue. Uh, and again, it's supply limited. Um, it's a very expensive product. Uh, we when we reduce the cost, we believe we can open that up quite a lot and become a much bigger market. And again, competing with some of the artificial red dyes will be a very important aspect to that. So uh, we see tremendous growth in this field and uh, we have other uh, color solutions in food coming along the way as well too, and, and also in textiles. And so it's not gonna be just carbonic acid either, it's gonna be a portfolio of, of different colors.